Thank you, Voice in the Sky. That was an amazing Voice in the Sky introduction. While we're getting uh, situated here, uh, I thought I'd set the context uh, a little bit around this panel. I, I uh, recognize that lunch was not too long ago. It might be a little bit warm in the room. Uh, and so we'll keep the energy level up, and, and hopefully you walk away out of this session with uh, actionable insights from this amazing set of panelists that we have here. But by way of context, um, this session today is a continuation of discussions uh, that we're having globally uh, from a PayPal perspective, uh, globally around um, growing an e-commerce business. Uh, and that's me. Uh, and so today's discussion is a follow-on on many of those discussions that we're having, but today we're drilling down into data, data insights, uh, and having an e-commerce growth mindset based on data insights. And we're going to uh, drill into, tease out, unpack three specific areas. First and foremost, we're going to talk about the tools and technologies um, that these folks leverage uh, to grow their companies, these folks leverage uh, to grow their companies on behalf of, of their merchants. Uh, and second, understanding those tools and technologies, we're going to talk about, uh, for specific problems, how they leverage those data insight, uh, business intelligent, uh, analytic tool sets uh, against problems. The first and foremost that we're going to talk about uh, is both a problem and an opportunity. It's the, the rise of, of mobile globally, uh, challenged uh, with mobile conversion gap. We'll talk about how these folks think about using tools to solve those problems and grow their companies. Uh, and then third, we're going to talk about demographics. Um, leveraging data insights against demographics, uh, the changing demographics globally, uh, rise of millennials, um, and the expectations that they have, as we've heard today, around experiences. Uh, and so I, I couldn't be more excited to talk with these folks uh, and have you all uh, get a sense on, on how they're thinking about data, how they're thinking about growing their companies based on data insights. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Adam, Matt, that's Matt, right? Matt. <laughs> and Matthew, let's give him a hand and get to know him a little bit better. So Adam, thank you so much. I'm gonna get there. And so thank you so much for being a part um, of this panel. Uh, I know it takes a lot to, to get up here on stage with your, uh, with your peers out in the audience, but maybe tell us a little bit about yourself in Canterbury. Yeah, sure. So um, also I'm Adam. Um, so Canterbury Products um, is a healthcare podiatry supply business. Um, focusing on foot health, foot care, um, supplying products to B2B and B2C customers. So we have Canonbury, which is our primary business, mm -hmm. which is mainly B2B focused. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have Simply Feet, which is B2C, which is foot care, foot health, and footwear yeah. um, into the B2C market. Awesome, fantastic. Um, using Magento 1 currently, and we're in the midst of replatforming to Magento 2 with Gene at the moment. And Matt from Gene is right next to you. Matt? Thank you, Rob. Rob, it is Rob. Yeah. Rob, Rob. Um, <laughs> so, uh, at Gene Commerce, we're a Magento SI. Uh, vast majority of what we do is professional services, um, design, build, strategy for for merchants, yeah. such as Canterbury. Um, but we also work in the um, sort of module market, do various integrations, tools, most notably for uh, for Braintree. Nice, great, Matthew. All right, how's it going, everyone? Good afternoon. Matthew Wosley. I am part of the Magento product marketing team, but really focusing on data and our business intelligence product. Um, joined Magento through the acquisition of RJ Metrics, so I've been in the e-commerce analytics business, business intelligence space for a little bit, and really just looking forward to the, the conversation today. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Matthew. So, um, Adam, let's start with you. So there's a lot going on. So your B2C, your B2B, um, your Magento house, um, and it sounds like you're replatforming to Magento yeah. 2 currently. Um, can you, from a data perspective, so when you're making the decision to replatform uh, from M1 to M2, can you walk us through the sort of decisions that you made to that process? And, and from a data perspective, you're hoping to grow from that. Can you yeah. give us a little sense on, on what those decision points were? Sure. I mean, so the initial decision to make the move was based on end of life gotcha. um, from Magento 1. So it was kind of a time to let's try and get there, let's try to get to Magento 2 um, before end of life comes around. Um, and then with the release of the B2B features, mm -hmm. so we started to look at that. Um, and then as we dealt, we delve further into the data looking at mobile usage, conversion rates on mobile versus desktop. We currently have a poor mobile offering. Gotcha. So we can see from the data that 
what we can see on the mobile translates that data. It's not good, it's not great compared to what our desktop offering is. Yep. Um, so we looked into that and thought, okay, well, there's a big opportunity here with M2 being responsive um, and to redo the mobile side of the business um, and try for a bit more of a mobile first mentality as opposed to desktop at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And so, um, so Matt, besides the, the end of life story, um, for the body of work that you do with merchants, do they have typical, is it is a similar sort of decisioning point when they're thinking about a replatforming effort or, or what's the data, what's the data driven decisioning around that, around ROI? Adam's story is reasonably typical that we've, we've come across. Every merchant's slightly different, depends at what point of their, their life cycle they are with their, with their e-commerce platform. Um, I think it doesn't take a, a data package or analytics package to, to indicate that more work needs to be done in a mobile platform. So that conversation tends to be um, pretty, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. The end of life certainly is, is sparking a lot of thought, right. um, whether that be replatforming, upgrading, or what have you. But I think the um, yeah the real driving force are to to replatform loosely connected with data is around mobile and also personalization and being a bit more uh, proactive on a website to uh, to to deliver a better experience on a customer by customer basis. Gotcha. And do you need a, a, a platform that's geared up for doing? Yeah, and so for the, the customers that have made that move, it's been a positive experience, and so from a data perspective, growth ex perspective, it's been roundly positive? Uh, we, we've, ha we've had good, I mean, like, like any SEO, we've, we've cut our teeth on Magento 2 sure. builds. I think in the last uh, 12 months, we've had um, some very positive results from M2 clients, um, yeah. in particular the opportunity to uh, to really improve mobile experiences. That's, okay. that's been the, probably the biggest uh, shift. Gotcha, okay, great. And Matthew, from, from your side, so from the, uh, I don't want to say an outside perspective, but from a, a business intelligence tooling perspective, uh, it seems to me from our conversations that you think of, you think in terms of a merchant life cycle or a merchant journey um, from a, maybe a small merchant to a large merchant mm -hmm. and the steps along the way. Can you help us think about or talk about platform specifically, some of the things that folks in the audience should think about from, a, from their BI tool, analytics tool. Right, yeah, and so to touch on you know, Magento business intelligence specifically, right, yeah. it doesn't matter what version of Magento a merchant might be on, right? So it's compatible with all versions of Magento Commerce, which really just creates this seamless data experience no matter the version of Magento, right, or sure. the version that they're looking to upgrade to. When you think about the merchant journey, right, the, their approach and uh, application of data through the use of business intelligence um, definitely just plays this huge role in their, their overall growth story, but it can be applied, the technologies can really be applied at any stage of a merchant's life cycle. So when you think about an early stage company, right, they're really looking to acquire um, new customers as rapidly as they can, but really in a cost efficient manner the consistent and regular analysis of data can help them understand what's working, what's not, um, so that they can make the adjustments that they need to acquire value, valuable customers at a lower cost of acquisition to really extend their runway um, and reach a point of scale, gotcha. right? Yeah. For more mature merchants, they worked hard to develop that client base or customer base that they already have, and that's when driving retention, increasing customer lifetime value, really becomes this giant pool of, of fuel for growth, right? Yeah. But it doesn't happen organically all the time. And that's when really using data and business intelligence in a strategic way becomes important because you need to identify the, the core opportunities that you have in front of you um, and where to invest time, energy, and resources. And when you're using data, it helps make that, uh, those decisions a lot more clear. Awesome, you know, that's, that's good perspective. So, so um, when you have the right platform in place, it seems to be the next step, and, and Matthew, you touched a little bit on this from a tooling perspective. Um, you have to have the right tools to manage the data, to understand the data, so I'd love to understand from, from you folks what some of those tools are. Specifically, Adam, you know, when you look at the business, the businesses, what's the source of truth and what do you really rely on the most? I mean, generally, we tend to rely heavily on Google Analytics. Um, I mean, we can see 
stats for every kind of action on the site. We yeah. can see where customers are coming in, we can see where they're dropping off. Yeah. We can see what they're looking at, we can track PPC campaigns. Um, we can get an understanding of how they're using the site um, and also what device they're using, what sure. um, browser they're using and start to take that data and look at it ourselves and see where the areas of improvement are. Yep. Um, secondly, we use a tool called SEM Rush. Don't know if any of you guys yeah. use that. Um, we've started to use it in the last five or six months and it's, um, it's, it's an SEO tool essentially. Yeah. Um, and what it does, it gives us the gaps that are in um, organic traffic keywords that are in analytics. Yep. It gives us a clear indication and we can see where we're ranking, we can show ranking shifts, we can see opportunities to improve and quite a big part of that is we can also see what our competitors are doing. Oh, yeah. So we can track what our competitors' PPC terms are, we can see what their organic keywords are and where we are pitched against them and kind of use that data um, to think, okay, they're doing a bit better than we are here, yeah. let's have a go, see if we can get above them. So it sounds like what you're saying is the the day-to-day -day management, GA, looking at opportunities to grow from a data perspective, SEM Russian. Yeah, and yeah. Was, yeah that's sure. fantastic. And so, uh, Matt, from your side, it, so uh, body of work, uh, client base, um, is is there a set of tools that are best practices, or are there, you know, what's your perspective on sort of the data side of the, the tooling? Um, we see a lot of variance with, with each merchant. I think, you know, you, I'll say the, the standard ones that most people would expect that just... Um, kind of a no-brainer, which would obviously be uh, GA. GA we, we, we use Magento BI. I think we've got um, uh, less marketing products because it's not really the where, where, we, where we're at, but a lot of the multivariant and A-B testing mm. stuff, optimizely, yeah. high conversions, those, those sort of things. But um, we've, I, I, it's often the, often the case that merchants install software or use tools like this. Um, because they think it's going to solve their problems, rather than actually approaching what the what the issue they're trying to solve or what um, what idea they have that they need to validate and fit mm. the fit the tooling to to that problem. Yeah. It's not not one system is going to give you all of those those answers. And you've also got to be a bit careful that you know you're looking at data and it's providing um, uh, not, not false. Prophecy, really, if, sure. if, if you like. So um, it's, it's telling you the way the website currently works, and therefore you start to, to believe it. So it's, um, uh, I think we certainly try to use them more as a validation for the, for the idea. Yeah. Um, we have started to use Google Data Studio okay. uh, extensively. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the single point of truth right. in terms of uh, where that is, and that's becoming um, more and more a topic for discussion. Where's the product catalog? linked with the single customer view, for instance, of a mm -hmm. customer, or recency frequency modeling, yeah. uh, are you using multiple uh, data sets, or are you just bring it into, into one? Yeah. Um, and we've found that Data Studio is actually a very good tool for um, quick validation, quick data set yeah. um, processing and algorithms. Gotcha. No, that's, that's a good perspective. And, and I know, Matthew, um, familiar with the BI tool, um, but if we're talking about that single source of truth for merchants and, and agencies, um, talk a little bit about, so we've got GA, we've got other tools that are out there, um, and it seems like there's an opportunity to have multiple different sources of truth. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the MBI perspective on you know, finding that single source of truth? Right, so I mean, anytime a merchant begins to grow yeah. and continues to grow, their, their data scenario is just naturally going to going to become more and more complex. It just happens, it's inevitable as more systems get added, um, different parts of the organization begin analyzing different data sets, defining things differently. It just becomes messy and difficult to, to, to really get a, a, a grasp around. And when you're able to bring data in from all these disparate sources, right, and bring it together and create that single source of truth, right, in some sort of data warehouse, what that does is provides a universal gateway, right? Um, that just generally makes accessing and analyzing data across an organization a lot easier. Sure. And um, it does so in a way that's very scalable. And when we say scalable, we really mean in the sense of both from a data infrastructure standpoint, but then also you know, organizationally as well. It's a tool and a system that can be used by multiple functions. Yeah. And what that does is just creates this environment that um, 
makes it easier to get insights. And those insights are really just derived from the data that all these disparate systems, right, are collecting yeah. and the value that it adds when combined with um, core commerce data, right? The data that Magento is collecting about products, orders, customers. And that's how an organization truly goes from analyzing things in these, you know, separate silos yeah. to beginning to draw correlations across those data sets and understanding things like, you know, the impact that the number of support tickets a customer might file um, has on their overall customer lifetime value and their likelihood to make a repeat purchase during a specific time period, such as like the holiday season, yeah. right? So just the value that data has um, exponentially rises when it's brought together under one single, um, one single platform, like whether it be Magento Business Intelligence or another solution that a yeah. merchant might decide yeah. to go with. So have that source of truth, bring as much data in there as possible so that you can um, be very in tune with the business from Magento orders, Magento mm -hmm. products, all the way across the board. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and I, you would agree with that, right, yeah. Matt? And also Adam? Adam already agreed now. You he, I'm, 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 well, I'll be stupid not to agree. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, right. Uh, all right, so you have the, the platform in place. You have the tools and technologies in place. Let's um, be a little bit more tactical and say, OK, we have a problem set. Um, and one of the problems that we heard earlier uh, in amazing session earlier, the, the keynote, um, is mobile, the rise of mobile, but the challenge is mobile conversion. What we see globally, 3.5% desktop conversion rate, 1, 1.5% 1 .1 for mobile represents hundreds of billions of, of dollars of opportunity globally. Um, so Adam, from your perspective, um, with a, a notion of uh, platform and uh, uh, tools, how do you, are you seeing the same thing against mobile and how is your company approaching solving yeah, some so of those gaps? Similar differences. So B2B, our conversion rate runs 16, 17%, yep. and then mobile is around six. So a significant difference. Then B2C, we're about five and a half, and 1.3, 1.4 on mobile. Yep. Um, so we have got those differences. Um, and as, as I said before, our mobile offering is suboptimal, is my polite way of putting it. Um, so we, that's, that's like I said, it's a key catalyst for our move, it's a key catalyst for what we're doing, is we know that data's there, we know people are using mobile, we can see where they're dropping off, so just making it easier for them to use the site. Um, quick checkouts, just, just the quick wins on yeah. mobile that we should be doing, really. Yeah, and so it, it sounds like, it, as we mentioned before, that's part of the catalyst to move platforms, yeah. and that's where that gets addressed, but you're keenly aware of that and, yeah. and working actively to close that gap. Yeah. 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 That's great. And so, Matt, from your side, from, um, what's your firm doing for customers or what's the request from customers to, to, to try and close that mobile, mobile gap? Well, it is. I think every, every, every merchant we come across, they're, they're um, seeing the same thing. So the rise of traffic, but the yeah. rate of conversion rate and sales is not keeping pace with that, that increase. And I think the days have gone where um, the mobile solution is simply a, a crunched up response version of the desktop. Yeah. Um, view, and we still fall into the trap that even uh, some merchants, eighty percent mobile traffic, we're still also paying equal emphasis on the desktop solution from a from a design phase. It it, it is taking quite a, a behavioural shift really to focus on the the primary channel here yeah. on mobile, and I think it's it's not just a question of the the user experience. I think there's some standardised layouts and, and menu solutions now that are becoming best practice on mobile, but it's also looking at the, the payment method options, mm -hmm. reducing uh, friction in the checkout, and also actually the the layout and the uh, the merchandising of, of certain products in a mobile situation. So, uh, for one of our one of our merchants, we could tell using using some uh, business information tools that the vast majority of purchases on on the mobile were under a certain average order value, and therefore we could gear and trend. Products on the the homepage design, or further up the the oh, listing on the category page, based on make, device, based on device, yeah. and at a lower, more impulse buy solution, for instance. Nice. Um, so we could track again. Another client was using using mobile devices at a particular point in the day, mm -hmm. and then before we could, it was a, a healthcare uh, brand, um, big on. Uh, uh, bath bath products for for babies, and you could see there was a spike around bath time yeah, in the uh, evening. Right. So then you could gear that that approach um, to merchandising products at that particular. So it's not a one size fits all for mobile. Um, it's being smart about 
the trends and how the, the folks are experiencing the brand and making sure that you're tailoring that experience for folks yeah, based on device or based yeah, on exactly yeah. applying a bit of in context thinking yeah. to when someone's on on that device yeah. and you know the mobile the mobile wallets that you know we we helped integrate with with Apple Pay must be 12 18 months months ago yeah. and it's been relatively slow take up i think in in terms of the, the number of brands that have actually adopted. Uh, oh, versus the usage, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think once you've, once you've used it and you've, you've made a purchase on a product detail page, and you've not even hit a checkout, actually then when you step back and go through that laborious process of getting your credit card out, it feels actually archaic. Yeah, particularly on, on a four-inch yeah, screen. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But, but the actual, the, I guess, the psychology of, of or the, the, the shift in behavioral uh, attitude to doing it, it does feel broadly unnatural. Yeah. Just your thumbprint will take you through to the success page. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this at some point last night after a, <laughs> after a club soda, I yeah, think. That too. We, yeah. we researched, we're going to be bringing out a white paper in a, in a couple of weeks, we researched the top 250 online retailers in the UK to find out what payment methods they were using, specifically in the mobile context. So we, we assessed it, PayPal, PayPal Express, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Amazon Pay, Klarna, Bitcoin, all of those. And the results are quite stark in terms of how few merchants are adopting some of these new payment gateways. Mm. Even, even, so the vast majority obviously still have, have PayPal, you'll be pleased to know. But that's, actually, fanta that's fantastic news. And that wasn't, that yeah. wasn't set up, but um, far fewer actually use the Express checkout up the flow, still resorting to a PayPal solution at the end of the checkout, mm -hmm. rather than actually creating a more convenient experience further yeah. up the, uh, the flow. Yeah. I mean, out of the 250, I think, um, don't quote me on the stats, but it was in the region of 15 merchants out of that 250 that were using Apple Pay. Wow. Five, well, Google Pay's only just come out, but uh, yeah, under half were uh, using any kind of express checkout in the car area. It was all mm -hmm. still through when we've implemented Apple Pay on merchants that have high volume of mobile traffic, particularly the millennial world, it has had a dramatic impact on, on conversion rate. Yeah. Mm. But it's, it's starting with that data-driven look at it and figure out what that experience is all the way through, watch the data, have a great platform, and do the things that you need to do. Yeah. You know, I was just trying to summarize your... Did I, did I waffle? No, 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 no. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a valley and peaks. But nice, yeah. okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll take that. So, uh, I apologize, that was too much. Uh, so Matthew, from your side, uh, so y you must have absolutely fascinating data uh, around you know, the sorts of experiences, but, but when your team thinks about specifically mobile and conversion, are there, there some thoughts that you have or some takeaways that you have for the audience? Yeah, I mean, Philosophically, I think it will help if we all, and I truly believe this, if we need to start thinking about mobile as, as an actual space, right? Um, as opposed to a physical object that we carry with us everywhere we go. Sure. You know, we hang out there, we spend time, we socialize, we transact, and seemingly move around within it. And if we begin to innovate with that mindset, I think that will transcend into delivering ultimately familiar and relatable experiences for them consumers, right? And when something's familiar, that helps bring to, to life this comfort for them. Yeah. And I think that will play a big role in mobile conversion. And I think a lot of the, the research that we're doing will kind of surface that. Um, you know, there's just this big opportunity for all of us to really define what success in the mobile space looks like and um, really figure out and determine the role that is going to play in the overall customer journey. Um, and really just the ground within the mobile environment is extending our, the area in which we can work within to nurture customers, right? Yeah. Current customers are future prospects, but the challenge is how are we giving them the confidence to ultimately make more significant purchases yeah. in the palm of their hand while they're you know, on the train going to work at the football game or standing in line at Starbucks, right? Yeah. And you know, we're gonna do that by continuing research and through like innovation with things like progressive web applications, and I think those will be um, you know game changing, but that's the fun stuff, and it's awesome. why we're all here today. Yeah, no, that's great. So uh, we're gonna we'll have a, at least two minutes for questions. So I think maybe one or two questions. Um, so have your questions ready. Uh, maybe in just a quick lightning round, is there one takeaway that you have? We were gonna talk about three. 
if there's the top one takeaway for the audience against you know, having a, a growth mindset against data, is there one takeaway that you would have for the audience, Adam? Yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of data, one of the things that we did um, early on this year was actually ask our customers for feedback. And it's data in a round set because we asked customers a specific set of questions and got to brutally honest feedback, which was great. Yeah. So we can then use that data to actually give our customers what they want online and an experience that they want. Yeah. Um, so I mean, my, my biggest thing would be don't be afraid to talk to your customers. Yeah. They're the ones that transact with you. They're the ones that come back to you. Um, they're, they're the pinnacle, really. Awesome. Matt, for you? Just one? Just that, oh, you get this one. You actually have 10 seconds. Uh, st st <laughs> Five seconds. <laughs> Four. Three. Four. Um, it, it's, it's a minefield. There's so many aspects, so many com uh, component parts to an e-commerce site. If you're looking at, uh, a, a, not a quick win, but where to start, I would recommend starting right at the end of the order uh, process. So work back from uh, why someone just abandons, and you fix each component part as you go further up the, the trail, rather yeah. than spending money uh, feeding the funnel at the top, you obviously have to do that. But if you fix it from the baseline and work your way back up the uh, the, uh, the flow. Yeah, love it. And Matthew? Yeah, I think when you have a mindset around you know using data insights for, for growth, um, obviously you're going to be testing a lot. And I think something that's critical is always just making sure whatever you're testing is measurable mm. um, so you know whether it's working or not. And that sometimes goes without saying, but it's something that we continuously need to be thinking about, understanding what we're actually trying to accomplish with these tests, the gap or the void that is trying to, to fill, and then just you know, keep it an iterative process, because you're not going to solve everything the first try, and you know, just make sure that you're continually making progress. It's not about perfection, right? It's about making progress you know, every step of the way. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, so we have time for, I think, one question, maybe two. Uh, but as you're thinking of those questions, let's give these folks a hand. It takes a lot to get up in front of your peers. They did a fantastic job. Do we have any questions? I, th I think I know what the first question is. What about GDPR? Is that the first question? That's what we were assuming the only yeah. question would be. What about GDPR? What? <laughs> hey, Matt, would you like to what, ask what, that? Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to answer that question? No. Matt Parkinson from Gene Commerce? It, what particular aspect of GDPR? Uh, just, just, that, I didn't just ask the question. GDPR. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question, Rebecca? And how it relates to data. What does it stand for? Sorry? How does it? <laughs> um, Fear there's there's a reason about ambiguity around GDPR, and I was surprised that I had to consent to 100 merchants the day before GDPR, and yet I still received their marketing emails the next day, even though I hadn't <laughs> consented. So, um, yeah, time time will tell. What one thing that has uh, cropped up, particularly in the Magento uh, Magento 2 world, you have to be careful of the uh, uh, the cookie banner um, acceptance because if uh, it will wipe all cookies for GA. So you're not careful about it, you'll end up two weeks later having not tracked any stats. In GA. A little, uh, so tip. in terms of that, obviously we're kind of getting around that with assumed consent. Like if you continue browsing this site, we assume that we're okay to track you. Is that acceptable? I, I, there's, some there's some debate about that. I think from, from my understanding, I, well, I don't think assumed consent is actually relevant, but uh, as in it's um, that's the purpose of it, but I think from what I've read is that certainly if that data is linked with third party um, tracking devices, then, then no, you have to uh, have explicit consent. But I'm not charging thousands of pounds for GDPR advice, so don't take my word for it. <laughs> is there any other questions? I think we have one down in the front. Sorry. Okay, I think Just then we have to cut it off. I forget to look down. <laughs> Thanks. Um, very short for Matthew, one question. At what stage Magento business intelligence makes sense? Like how big that e-commerce needs to be so it makes sense to implement business intelligence? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And it comes up in conversations that I'm having with merchants on a regular basis, right? When does it make sense to implement um, BI? And it really, it just comes down to the prioritization of, of data within any given organization, right? Like I said, technology can be implemented at any stage of a merchant's life cycle from infancy all the way through like maturity. Um, but there's going to be 
before it gets implemented, there's going to be this inflection point, right, where there's going to be this general gut feeling around, okay, what we're doing right now in terms of data and insights isn't scalable, right? You're going to feel this bottleneck of data that just becomes unmanageable, and you can either choose to kind of ignore it because it becomes tough to prioritize in the day-to-day, -day, right? Or you can get ahead of the bottleneck that you see coming in the future. So um, I don't think it's ever too early, but there's going to eventually become this inflection point where you're like, okay, I, I, think, we, I think it's time to actually put processes and systems in place that automates a lot of this and gives us that single source of truth that makes our lives a lot easier, easier when it comes to accessing and analyzing data across our entire organization. Does that make sense? I think we're... Well, maybe one more if there is one. No? Okay, well, thank you oh, very um, much. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh. See? It's <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think the question is going to be, Matt, what about GDPR? <laughs> I could do a GDPR one for you. No, I've got to go. So. We, got, we, haven't got, we haven't got the rest of the day. Um, if you were to each, without conferring, choose your three KPIs which drive a website, the ones that get most of your brain time, um, what would they be? And that's for each, everybody individually. I mean, expecting nine different, or maybe they're all the same. You're talking about KPIs on the website for what we're, look, what we're looking at? Principle and the principal analytic that you like to use as a way of gauging how well the website is doing. Okay. We sit in many boardrooms where the, the chief exec is obsessing over a particular stat in Google Analytics, whether it's bounce rate or error pages or you know, the, the visitor numbers are going up and the conversion rate's going down, he'll concentrate on the conversion rate. There's only really one number that matters terms of sales, so uh, um, when you're looking at um, GI, G, uh, GA, um, I think um, there, there are, I can think of two straight off, there's two things we can do for most sites when they come to us, is improve their speed and um, assess and improve their search capability. If your search conversion rate off your search traffic is not two, three, four, five times what it is um, without search, then there's, there's broadly something wrong with that. So mm -hmm. those are the two first areas we would always um, to look at. Um, when we're building strategy around uh, a site, there's, there's three areas we, well, there's three metrics that we look at, obviously is sessions, AOV, and conversion rate, and we build specific strategies uh, for each one of those particular avenues. Okay. I gave you a bit more time to think. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> well, this is on video, though. This is on yeah. video. This is being stored for all, all time. <laughs> I, think, I think from just an overall commerce perspective, um, you know, there's a couple that come to mind that are general best practices that a lot of organizations are using tools like MBI to monitor on a regular basis just to understand the health of their organization. And one is just customer lifetime value, right? Um, this is website kind of speed optimization aside. This is around just general commerce KPIs. Customer lifetime value is huge um, just because it represents successes or failures in a lot of different aspects of your business, right? Um, the other one would be repeat order probability. That's something that's helping merchants understand how well they're doing at retaining their customers and what's the likelihood that, you know, if somebody makes one purchase, that they're going to come back and make a second and make a third because a lot of the times what merchants will see is that after, you know, you get somebody to make a second purchase, the likelihood of making a third jumps up exponentially um, just because you're deepening the relationship that you have with that consumer. And I think the third one that kind of ties all together, you know, fills in the gaps between those two is just average time between orders and average order value. So um, how long is it taking those merchants to come back and make that repeat purchase? And then how much are they spending at each step of the way? And is that value of their, is the value of their orders going up or down? I think those are three that come top of mind that a lot of merchants are using MBI to monitor um, that can be very difficult to do on a regular basis if it's not automated. I suppose, I mean, not to copy Matt, but revenue, to be honest. Um, at the end of the day, we're a retail business, so revenue can tell you if there's a problem. If you look at a channel year on year, you look at a channel month on month, 
and the revenue's up, you know, you're doing what you need to do. If it's down, why is it down? And that's a key indicator of how those websites are performing is how your revenue's tracking. <laughs> I've got D3. Uh, two, in which case, conversion rate, because you look at, you know, conversion rate is where you get your revenue from. Um, and third, I'll go left field and some of the I track quite a lot, um, exit page. So I look at where customers are leaving our sites, what pages they're leaving on, and see, okay, so why are they leaving on that point? To what, what was their journey? And I can then go back and see where their journey was, what they've looked at, what they've viewed. And then if they've left, and you, you know, sometimes you can see there's a reason, maybe there's a broken link, maybe there's a broken page. Um, you can start to fix things that could be potential issues, and you can use that data. Say if you've got 10% of people leaving on a certain page, you know there's a problem. So you go and look at it and you can fix it. And just to expand on the conversion rate very quickly. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, don't just look at the top, top line conversion figure. Actually, when you drill down into it, it tells a different story um, when you even, even yeah. as much as desktop, mobile, tablet. And then you drill down even further into the device or the area. And actually, um, if any, you easily spot if any particular device area <coughs> customer isn't converting at the, the site average. It's bringing the site average down, for instance. That's where you can identify particular products problems. So don't take the, the top line uh, conversion rate as a, you know, a, a oh, marker. Really. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, guys. Yep. Um, Thanks, everybody. If you could all join me in giving one final round of applause for oh, Rob, Adam, Matt, oh, and Matthew. Thanks. This is a great panel.